So when John and I were talking about uh, a, a movie, in fact, that we had both watched about a year ago, uh, Don't Look Up, we both thought it was a sad, sad uh, testament to how poorly um, our species and our governments and our, our society is dealing with the need to decarbonize our economy in a really big way, really fast. And since then, I've been thinking about different ways we might approach the problem. And I took some inspiration from the anti-apartheid movement. And so I'm going to give you a little perspective on maybe a way that we can accelerate change and, and uh, get some progress here. For perspective, the, the problem we have to solve, 50 billion tons a year we have to reduce. The current trajectory uh, is going to take about a century too long, and the general solution of pushing it back on the individuals isn't going to work, and the solution of waiting for technology to materialize isn't going to work. So what are we going to do? Uh, let's, let's look at what individuals can do. Individuals can easily make Easily, it's relative, it depends on your wealth and so on. You could make choices like putting solar cells on your roof or choosing a renewable energy provider in some places or buying the Tesla. But these make a difference on the margin. Uh, they won't get my footprint down anywhere near the, the two and a half that one speaker said was the target for the next few years. Um, it, it's just not going to happen. I have solar cells. Um, I have heat pumps. I have an electric car, but my footprint is still way too big, and it's not getting down there. Harder for me to deal with, harder for you to deal with, is, is uh, stuff like the supply chains. You know, if you, if you need a product, maybe some food from the supermarket, there are not too many choices, and most of them are not decarbonized. And so you don't have the option to to choose to buy the better product. You have the option to buy it or not buy it, and you know, that's, that, that's uh, not enough. And then the even hardest is the, the scope three stuff. We all are dependent upon uh, governments and schools and offices and infrastructure and water and sewer and all of these other things, none of which we have the individual ability to decarbonize. And so we, we, as individuals, we can get so far. And as a motivated individual, you can't substitute for less motivated individuals' non-desire to decarbonize their lifestyle. You can't go to negative two, negative three, and make up for other people not paying attention. So governments, too slow, too late. We can't really wait for governments to do what they have in mind, but I think there is a solution out there. So who knows who this gentleman is? Any, any takers out there? Well, I'm surprised. I asked, I asked one person this morning in the hallways, and he said, yep, I know who this guy is. Leon Sullivan. Leon Sullivan was a black pastor in the 1970s, and more relevantly, um, he was on the board of General Motors, and General Motors had a large um, a production platform, a production plant in South Africa. And he wrote the Sullivan Principles, which was perhaps the first social justice document, which formed the foundation for the anti-apartheid movement and for divestment in companies that continue to do business with the South African government. And he pushed things forward in a way that took 20 years, but uh, a small motivated cadre of individuals were able to change the system in a pretty substantial way in a time scale that's perhaps in accordance with what we need. So how can we take that idea forward? So the, the movement was able to galvanize significant financial pressure and apply it against companies and through companies against the governments in a way that made change. Now, I was a kid when, when this was going on. Uh, perhaps many of you were not even. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it was a powerful movement, and it was an inspiration for perhaps a way that we should think about decarbonizing the global economies. So the goal is to tilt our consumer behavior, our investing behavior, uh, away from companies that 
don't pay attention, and towards, I should say, more than companies, companies, organizations, cities, any of the large structural entities that are entrenching our carbon-based economy in a significant way, tilt our activities away from those companies and organizations and towards companies and organizations that do pay attention. And so, uh, by applying that pressure, we can persuade those companies to switch to renewables, to find new materials, to clean up their supply chain, and apply pressure to their peer companies, their suppliers, their partners, um, their buyers. And so, I think there's, there's room for uh, deep progress here. So I'd like to share three tales uh, from inside the boardroom, inside management. So I've had the privilege to serve on a couple of different, well, three different public boards, and I've watched the way they respond to challenges of this sort. Now, the, the first story I want to tell, it's the, uh, the story of a, a small electronics manufacturer. Um, and I, when, I was, when I first joined the board, um, I started to ask questions about their ESG strategy, and did they have a sustainability program? And then I got quizzical looks. Uh, there was not really much clarity on what, was, what, what I was talking about, why it would matter, or whether it would have an impact. And there were plenty of giant challenges for this corporation to solve, and so it kind of got brushed aside. And I wrote a paper um, outlining uh, why this company had actually a pretty good ESG story, but they weren't telling it. And by not telling it, the ratings agencies were uh, classifying them as an F or not rated. They were missing out on being in the investment funds that, that uh, look for the green screen. Um, they were getting a bad rap in a number of different areas. But it really didn't matter three or four years ago. There wasn't much tension on it. But over time, the, the public attention on ESG metrics, on the, the ratings that score companies on their ESG performance, I apologize, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, for anyone who doesn't understand. E is, e is the piece that we're all here talking about today, the environmental component, the sustainability piece of things. But if, if you get rated poorly for ESG, there's a lot of investors, a lot of funds, a lot of of uh, exchange-traded funds that won't touch your stock. So the cost of capital goes up for companies that are not rated or poorly rated, and equivalently comes down. It gets cheaper to borrow for companies that have a good rating. And so this particular company um, chose to find a chief sustainability officer, start telling the story, and now things are looking significantly more positive. So we had a good success story there. This company was actually the, the opposite. The management team leaned into ESG in a way that almost made me uncomfortable, that they were sub-optimizing their financial performance and, and their, their push towards uh, the, the corporate charter. They really leaned into ESG, um, and they came up with a lot of innovative programs. They were, I think, one of the very first companies in the sector to add ESG ratings to the management team compensation plan, which I think was pretty challenging. But one of the programs they came up with was this carbon labeling scheme. By putting a label on their products that said, this product embodies eight kilograms of carbon, um, and we've also offset it to zero. The, uh, the carbon neutral piece means we've purchased offsets to get rid of everything we can't renew. And they're big into recycled plastic, uh, lots of interesting focus there. And this company has started to see real gains in performance, and I think the, the investor and the customer's perspective on this is going to be quite positive. I think the, the key test here perhaps is on the consumer side. Would somebody faced with two different products, identical apart from this label, choose to pay more for the label that says this is a neutral, uh, a neutral component with uh, a cost of carbon that I can see versus the vanilla product. And the evidence would be that, yes, they do. The third story I want to tell is from my time at Netflix. And in 2015, I decided unilaterally and somewhat against the wishes of the rest of the senior management team that we were going to offset, we were going to buy renewables for all of the technology 
and then we were going to offset the rest. And so from 2015 onwards, the Netflix technology platform has been uh, net zero, which is, I think, a, an interesting push. And what we found is that the, the employees really resonated with that move. And at the time, hiring uh, great technical engineers is an expensive proposition. It's got even more expensive since, but a very expensive proposition. One of the tests that, that I consider is, uh, does the brand value of the company stand for enough to retain employees when other companies are trying to poach my employees away with a higher salary? And the answer is, it does. <laughs> and I, I think that uh, being net zero in 2015 was worth north of 10K, maybe as much as 50K in every employee's salary. Now, that's a pretty significant win. And in fact, it was sufficiently powerful that the next year or two, the management team embraced the idea and took it forward, and now Netflix, too, has a head of sustainability, and it's, it's net zero across its entire operation. It's doing significant work to decarbonize, and there's lots of interesting activity going on there. It's a big success on that one. So the, the key observation for me from these three stories is there's no religious opposition to companies and organizations doing the right thing. Instead, there's, there's inertia and friction and momentum. And the actual cost of taking action is not very high. But if instead you can give a little nudge and a little push in the right place, make a big difference. And when those companies start demanding the same of their suppliers and their partners, I think we can have a big impact. The chart here shows the rising engagement of consumers and the public in ESG. This is ESG searches um, from, on Google, and you can see a dramatic rise. There's another chart that shows 14 trillion of, of funds under management, funds that apply an ESG filter to their investments. Um, that too is hockey sticking upwards in a way that suggests that the world is ready to start um, uh, investing and, and spending and paying attention to these kinds of factors. And so the, the call to action here is be informed, <laughs> study the performance of the companies and the businesses that you choose to do business with or you choose to invest in, and tilt your investment behavior, your purchasing behavior, your engagement towards those companies that get a good rating, because that little bit of pressure may snowball in the way that the anti-apartheid movement snowballed to topple apartheid in South Africa in the 1970s. And we can make that happen now with the carbon economy. Thank you.